You can't get mad at people being wrong because the game does not make it easy to be right. It makes it really hard to be right. It does not convey a lot of things. I am Putnam. I was, uh, I've been a modder of the game since, I always say 2011, but I don't know if that's true. It might be 2012, actually. Tell us a little bit about kind of your, your coding and like your history work. Like you said that you've, you know, uh, modded Dwarf Fortress for quite some time now. Um, like, uh, what, what are some of the mods that you've made and like, what is, like, what's, what's your programming history, I, I, I guess would be the easiest way to start this off. Uh, the first mod I ever made was like, I was around 17, it was, uh, Fort Bent, which was a Homestuck mod. I was 17, do not blame me. And, uh, <laughs> it ended up, like, transforming into this horrible thing because I, like, learned about DF hacks, uh, extended modding tools, the scripting support, and I started including things for that, and I started, in, and I just kept getting more and more extreme with it in ways that, uh, it is not feasible for me to update it anymore, because it's, uh, I would I, I have been working on Dwarf Fortress's actual code, and it is less difficult than I expect updating Fort Bent to be, because of how much programming work went into that. That's how I got my start modding it. I ended up, like, the Dragon Ball mod I did later. That one is a lot less complex. I, that one could update whenever, as soon as DF Hack comes out even, maybe. Because I, uh, actually wrote it in a way that didn't, like, I wasn't in some sort of weird ADHD fugue where I just kept doing things for hours on end and don't remember any of it. Which is the case with Fort Bent. So, the, all, all, all that modding, I ended up, like, moving away from modding for a while that spent three years programming uh space station 13 stuff i was especially focused on optimization of things that are not appropriate for youtube because nobody else would touch that stuff but also things like atmospheric simulation which the game is famous for and is famously slow and i optimized that it's about a hundred times as fast on servers that use my atmospheric stuff than on like tg station which doesn't for perfectly uh good reasons because there's I think three people, including me, who understand my Atmos code, and that's a bus factor that's unacceptable to TG Station. And that's the sort of thing that you should worry about, right? Having only one or two people who understand your code base. Uh -huh. Yeah, that sort of thing. I, I understand all those concerns, and I think they're relevant. That's part of why I was a... I I'm very hardline, uh, this is Toadie's game. You shouldn't have to, like, cave to pressure for design stuff toady and zach's game for design stuff they shouldn't have to cave to pressure for anything and like the main like the main reason i was willing to accept becoming a programmer on this game is because no many people who actually feel as strongly about that as i do and uh i think having a second programmer is at least partially useful for just like making sure the game continues to exist into the future as long as possible because i think because that's like the main thing I want. I, I really like Dwarf Fortress. I keep coming up with ideas for games I might want to make, and then I think about that further, and I'm like, no, Dwarf Fortress is like a superset of that. I don't, I shouldn't make that. And it just keeps happening. So since we've kind of moved on nicely, uh, like, how did you get involved with beta testing? Because like, I, I noticed that you're in the, that you were in the credits at the, uh, uh, on in, at least in the initial release version I got. Um, so you'd already been involved in beta testing Dwarf Fortress for, for some time. So how did that come about? This is really funny. In March of 2022, I sent like a, I, I like just sort of remembered mentioning maybe bringing on other programmers aboard. And I was like, I guess it was a bad day or something. Usually I'm not worried about these things. But that day I was feeling like how you see all the weird forum people who like yell about like every little thing that might get in the way of the game and they're very concerned and all that. I was feeling that one day. I sent a big like like PM to the Toady one just to, like get that off my chest as if as in like if if you're if the game is like a success, you shouldn't feel the need to like be pressured into changing anything just because there's like a bunch more customers now or whatever yeah it's still dwarf fortress it should still be dwarf fortress and then i also just included a little tiny you know but but also if you get a programmer i should be considered right and then the, the next month i think it was no 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 june it was in june ended up getting a like just got invited to the beta test it was in that same like you know pm like conversation but i, I don't know if that even necessarily means it's connected it's just the convenient way to PM me at that point. 
Uh, it could just be rather. So that's basically how that happened. Uh, did you also ask what the process was like, or just how I got yeah. into it? Well, I, I hadn't. I think we talked about that before recording. But yeah, what was the the process of actually uh, reporting bugs at that point? Like, did was it just kind of in like Discord DMs? Was what was there like any kind of external tools that you guys were given, or were you just kind of playing the game and trying to crash it? Uh, there was a channel for it. The uh, there's a testing like with all the, the, the it, it was a version of the game with all the debug tools on so you know i can press whatever debug button there is and change the seasons or turn on what df hack calls fast dwarf two zero is it's just a debug option in the game mm-hmm. all that sorts of things but mostly i just played the game normally and tried to and like profiled it to see if anything weird was going on i have a normal sized monitor so while i noticed that like graphics rendering the graphics was actually like often the number one or number two biggest like perform like uh cpu hog in the game it really i i thought that's not an issue it's all on a different thread turns out it is kind of an issue on larger monitors but uh uh like that sort of thing just profiling i, I was profiling the game and running it through a debugger all the time to check like uh alternatively can't really do both at the same time most of the time unless you're like compiling it and debugging it with visual studio which i am now but at the time i wasn't uh and just like whenever it would crash, I would try to identify where the crash was, what was happening. At one point it actually froze, which is like completely different. And I profiled it, figured out where the loop was, and we eventually figured that out. And uh, that's a horror story and a half right there, that one. You want to hear about it? Go nuts. I've got all day. Cages in dungeons. If you had one and opened your buildings tab, the game would uh, end up in an infinite loop and freeze. Because uh, huh. we eventually figured out it was it was some stuff with the loop variable. C++ dutifully uh, lets you do what you want there. The details are, of course, they're, they're, they're not beyond me, just not uh, necessary. Either yeah. way, the, the main reason it's a nightmare is because I was only using cages in the dungeon because I had never done that before and thought, eh, I'll do it this time. I actually like had looked on the wiki earlier to see if they require if they require like space or anything and it turns out no and i was just feeling lazy and decided to do that because it didn't require as much space as normal and i only found the bug because i never used the buildings tab so i misclicked the buildings tab trying to click another tab because of like dysgraphia or whatever and i was trying to figure out what about clicking the thing i thought i clicked had caused the problem but it turned out to be the buildings tab and like eventually i sort of thought wow we, there would have just been a horrible like 100% CPU game freezes can't close it bug on release if nobody had if I hadn't coincidentally decided to just do cages one day and accidentally clicked on the buildings tab. That sort of thing is always a nightmare and that sort of thing popped up on the Steam release a couple times. Yeah. To nobody's surprise. Especially not mine. I wasn't surprised by that. When the release happened, I was, like, staring at all of the stuff to see if there was any showstopper that I just happened to not come across. And there are things like that. Yeah, I Dwarf, Dwarf Fortress is just such a game where, like, it, like you, you mentioned the buildings tab. Like, I think I played the game for, like, half a decade before I found that menu in the old version. <laughs> like, there, there's. I mean, the old capital R rooms menu was, yeah, was uh, hard to find. And not terribly usable either. Yeah, and like there's there's just a lot of menus in the game that are kind of like that. So it, like it really doesn't surprise me that there's just old, weird issues like that just in the game, or things that became a problem when the game got reworked in a lot of ways for the premium release. Great example of that. All the naked tavern goers. I, I see a lot of people talking about it as if it's a new bug. It's not. It's been in since taverns were added. Well, you, it, c- you could check. It, it's just like the the children that are less than one year old or less than zero years old like minus one year old with no skin apparently that's yeah. old too like it's just hard to tell zach was the graphics make it obvious zach was telling me about it at, at pax he's like yeah no we just noticed this bug now which apparently has been in the game forever it's just nobody reported it before because who's gonna notice the one line of text missing about their skin tone it is something because I, I mean, who's going to even notice? Yeah. Like who's going to go look at that? <laughs> and then even if somebody does notice, like they're just gonna be like, huh, weird. And like not say anything because like, it's not a concern in an ASCII game. 
but yeah, the second there's like it needs to call for sprites, then there's just like this weird issue of like this headless child. So at, at what point did they approach you proper to start working at Bay 12? And kind of also, I guess, a extension on that question, who reached out to you? Was it KitFox or Bay 12 specific? It was, uh, let's see. So KitFox reached out to me for working on it because they're the they're the ones who just generally handle all the like, you know, contract payment etc stuff so that's that makes a lot of sense it was it was in november i think around mid-november i was uh yeah i was in streams beforehand just and and immediately after the release just sort of watching lurking not saying at any point because you know confidential and it was uh so so that's part of why i was like immediately after release just sort of staring and like writing things down because i knew that it would probably be good to actually like get working on stuff immediately at some point and i've been spending like i i I was like at first i read the contract and i was like wow will i find that much time in a week to do stuff yes yes absolutely like in in the sense of will i find enough stuff to do then i looked at the list of stuff i'd already written down i was like i could probably fill months with just what i have written down that's not even accounting for like actually big stuff that needs to be done like the sdl2 port that i've been working on all week that wasn't even the question how did i get invited (laughs) that was basically it i'm I'm not sure what decision making process there was in the back for that i I didn't really ask i don't think about that I, i i just tend not to think about that stuff not on purpose it's just not something i think about yeah that's fair um, so we can just roll into the next subject, which we'd already kind of talked about it anyway, which is just kind of, uh, what do you expect your role at Bay 12 to be? Cause I, that's what people keep asking me is like, what's, what's putting, I'm going to be doing on the steam release. Like what, what, what is kind of your role currently, I guess, at Bay 12? It's, I think it's still all up in the air. Maybe I'll get like assigned things at a future point, but there's a, it's, it's still in a bit of a transitional period for various reasons. What I've been doing is just like uh you know finding the little oddities and bugs that i know about trying to fix them on the spot in a lot of cases it's worked out i I just keep sending in like code for little fixes like i don't know the uh selling live vermin fish who air drown after being sold crashes the game which has been in the game since 2006 that you you fixing that bug was particularly funny because i remember people warning me about be careful with vermin they can crash the game Oh, is that why? Yeah, I remember some just <laughs> ran, some random person in my chat was just like, I was, I was messing around with vermin traps, and they're like, "Be careful with those." That they so, sometimes my game crashes. I was like, "Okay," huh? And I just yeah, kind of stopped it, messing with vermin after that. <laughs> and uh, I mean, okay, the part of the code that fixed that uh, seems important. <laughs> That's all I, that, that, that's what I can say about it. It seems important. Maybe that'll fix, like, I don't know, like, raid crashes or something. Wouldn't that be nice? I don't know if that'll be the case, though. Oh, uh, what are, what are it the is odds possible. that they're, like, getting cage, like, tra- like, vermin traps with live vermin in them on raids? Oh, no, it's far more general than live vermin. It was, like, oh, updating uh, <laughs> all the general, it was, like, updating refs, certain refs in items that were being, like, transferred, like, it was transferring refs from one item to another or whatever, which... Uh, the DF hack person who, like, founded the first place said that it's only called by, uh, fish vermin stuff, but you never know with, like, how, uh, I I didn't check where it's all called, and you never know with, uh, optimizing compilers. It could be, like, five, it could have turned it into five different functions or whatever. Wow. I'm, I'm not a programmer, so, like, I understand these words, but, like, for, for me personally, a lot of it just goes over my head, but that is totally fine. Um, so like, I, I guess kind of the, the process right now is like, you have access to the code and you're just kind of going through and putting in little fixes and tweaks. Like, have they assigned you anything to do specifically, or is it just kind of like familiarize yourself with the code? Okay. Like I know, um, uh, Tarn posted, I think it was in the future of the fortress that he was like, just kind of backseat driving while you were in the code a couple of times, just messing around with things. Uh, yeah, no assignments so far. I wouldn't be surprised if I got some in the future. Uh, I wouldn't, I, 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 I do those, but like, I, I took it upon myself to port to SDL2 sooner rather than later. I'm not sure why I did this necessarily. Uh, it seems like a, it's because I heard it was a prerequisite for Mac. I don't know how true that is, but it'll definitely make it easier for Mac, which is good. Uh, the ports are important. It'll probably just be easier to do the ports if 
like that's or if that's already been updated first either well okay less easier to do the ports if that's updated first but easier to update before doing the ports either way it's i think it's easier to do it in this order and it, it, it's it's worked it's going pretty fast actually did so I, i'm doing some like minor rework stuff that i probably shouldn't be but there was like oddities with input and i need that i needed to fix and that ended up ballooning so since we're on the subject anyways um I, I people ask me about the ports all the time. Um, do you have any idea how far off something like a, a native Linux build would be, or is that just kind of still a wall of question marks? Uh, it's not a. It's not completely a wall of question marks. It's a uh, just a matter of like getting a nice setup together, which is again transitional. I have like a solid state drive that I can use to get more stuff together. Like probably getting a Steam Deck so that I can test it better but it's not like a a big question marks it's just a like a process that it it's going to need to go through in a bit the the main question marks here isn't like getting it up but getting it like always up if you get me like make sure there's never a delay like this again have like a what's the general term for what i'm looking for like a, a proper build system that will like build the game for all the platforms it supports like at the same time ideally uh, it takes a bit to set one up, but it's not terribly difficult. So my my next kind of subject I have listed on here is um, what, what's it like debugging Tarn's code? Because I see, uh, you know, like Tar Tarn was a hobbyist programmer, now successful uh, programming artist. I would I would kind of not hesitate to say, um, and uh, we're at a point where I think there's a lot of people who kind of look in at Dwarf Fortress from the outside or poke it with DF hack and kind of go grumble, 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 bad code. Um, what is it like, like kind of actually having access to it and going through it versus like poking it from the outside? What's the, what, what is it like debugging Tarn's code? Poking at it is surprisingly similar in a lot of ways. It's just a lot easier the only real grumble grumble there's there's not much of that the only grumble grumble stuff which all the reverse engineering people seem to have noticed is just like occasional oddities with how like some loops are structured i guess it's not really a I wouldn't call it, it it's just something to get used to and i'm used to it now you might notice that's like in the muck i guess like in the really low level details that don't actually matter actually debugging the game is pretty easy actually it's 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 organized well enough that i'm not that I don't get lost most of the time, that I don't get lost when I'm, like, knowing what's happening when, if you get me. Like, if, if there's a crash that's happening, uh, most of the time I'm not lost. There's been a bit, but that's, like, very cursed stuff. Like, heap corruption. Like, like, he, it, it, it's a bug in, like, if, if you uh, just delete and assign and delete and assign and keep adding and deleting squads eventually the game crashes due to heap corruption i i don't i really don't know <laughs> i i don't know where that's happening but it's 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 one of those things where it only crashes after the problem has already happened and then the next time you try doing something in the vicinity of that problem it crashes which is not fun odd yeah i don't i i thought it would be an easy another easy one but it's not <laughs> uh it's, I, i'll i'll keep like looking at that and making a puzzled face or whatever for a while, for a bit eventually i'll probably find something like pretty clear in the uh like ui code or something it, it's it's specifically when like trying to add to a vector that's like it's not even resizing or anything i, I don't know what the problem is it, it doesn't make much sense huh. to me but it's not I, I i mean i don't know what the specific problem is i know what the general problem is so it's not that bad it's just a matter of getting underneath it i suppose um, yeah, I'll just find it. I'll find it. Since since you have experience with multi-threading weird systems in SS13, and I know that you've already like talked about it in my chat um, to a degree, what do you think is possible in regards to multi-threading just so that people stop pestering me about it? I got a performance improvement from multi-threading temperature on my own time already, but, but, I... I <laughs> I only that was in uh, Iron Shore or whatever it was called that I was testing, and uh, I did not run the game for long enough to see if it just explodes uh, spontaneously at some point or similar, which is act which is definitely possible to see if like 
like I'm not even sure I ran the game long enough for someone to like move an item from below ground to above ground, which would cause a temperature change that would have to be processed and all that. Or like uh, migrants or a caravan coming in would also cause a lot of that. Uh, and like if a mi- if like it's possible that if I was just like ah oh, that looks like it's working, let's just put it in the game, and then you put it in the game and bug. 25% of the time, and this is not consistent on reload, uh, caravans uh, catch fire for no reason. That sort of thing. That's that's the that's the main thing you need to worry about with multi-threading, and it's the main reason uh, it's not the first, second, third, or fourth choice you usually want to go for for optimizing stuff. So what do you think you're going to be doing in regards to optimization stuff? Because I know that some of your code has already made it into the game that made the game run quite a bit quicker. Uh, Just keep profiling slow forts see what's slow see if that can be made faster and as you can see just like the first instance of that was already a pretty good improvement you just keep doing that until all the low-hanging fruit is gone and then you have to like start looking at algorithmic stuff like if 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 all the low-hanging fruit's gone and it's not possible to speed up anymore the next step would be uh the thing i sped up is um like line of sight code of course there is enough. There is a way to speed it up that I know would work, that I know would be low in bugs, and that would just take a long time and be mildly annoying to do. Uh, and that is to um, move all of the stuff that the game needs from units, or copy all that stuff, to a much smaller data structure, which is held in a flat vector. That is, one that isn't a vector to pointers, but just a flat vector that says... I am representing this unit ID, and these this is the information you need to know for the line of sight stuff. And then it can iterate through that probably a lot faster, and it would improve that part of the code's like speed quite a lot. And but it would take a while, and yeah, I, like like it's basically just taking a bit of a entity component system system that was not a redundant system. I meant to say that like just taking some of the principles from that and applying that to bits of the code. But like because in general, in modern programming, quite a lot of modern programming optimization is just uh, CPUs love arrays, and CPUs love to be told what to do and that they might, and not that they are going to do this. They are definitely going to do this, not you might do this or this. CPUs are less good with that. Uh, and like the big optimization with line of sight code was straight up nothing else but just saying hey, you're always going to do this. You don't need to check whether or not you need to. And believe it or not, that made it faster. (laughs) Just because uh, the skipping was taking a long time. Why am I getting flashbacks to the, like, whole books speeding up world gen thing? Uh, A lot of... Most code is slow due to, like, slow algorithms... Due to, like, algorithms that just grow. The books thing was, like, you know, there's N... Uh, historical figures, and each historical figure is writing books, and uh, the more books there are, the more books they need to check, and you could see how that would just balloon, sort Mm -hmm. of, at least faster than linear. Uh, The uh, quote-unquote FPS death you see people talk about is basically the same thing, but with units. As the number of units increase, the number of units that need to be checked grows and grows, and... I mean, dead units actually are not checked at all now. Like, they're not skipped, they're not checked, they're not included in the list of things. It it, it pre-caches a bunch of uh, stuff that needs to be checked, and dead units at least aren't bloating FPS death at all. So that's good. But, uh, and the big problem is just that, like, unit processing is inherently kind of ON squared, and there's no real good way to get past that, so that just grows faster than other stuff. Pathfinding is, it grows linearly with the number of units, so it can't compete (laughs) in the long term. Uh, in the short term, it can, and in and there's of course the big cause of like actual real FPS death in the sense of my fortress suddenly dropped to two FPS and I cannot wait out whatever's causing that is mm-hmm. that's pathfinding ninety nine percent of the time just issues with like stuff needing to repath over and over or uh, like temperature or water movement changing how uh, connectivity works and like you have a tile. The tile has a number associated with it. Another tile over here also has a number associated with it. If the numbers are the same, those tiles are reachable from each other. The game has to recalculate that by, like, flood filling a bunch if there's too much uh, water activity going on. Mm-hmm. If, if if it, like, goes above four out of seven, then that has to be recalculated. If there's fire going on, that has to be recalculated. And that's a lot of what you'll see with 
Uh, that That's a lot of what drops things down to sub-10, calculating that. And, like, if you see a bunch of dwarves, like, they're... If invaders are killing FPS, that's probably because your dwarves are, like, trying to go through there, seeing invaders running away. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, they're like, okay, but there's a job over there. I want to go do it. Oh, no, invaders. There's a job over there. I want to go, like, just... They, can, they just keep doing that and pathing a bunch. Obviously, the solution to that is to, uh... Make it so that when dwarves flee, they don't stop running until they reach their bedroom. But, uh... <laughs> lock the door behind them or something funny like that. Uh, you know, actually come to think, based on how the players act, that might... That, that might even be desired. But, uh, Give us, like, a bell, like in Age of Empires. Hit the bell, and then everybody runs inside. I mean, you know... Cancel all jobs! Run inside! The functionality for that's still yeah. the game. The civilian alerts. There's just no button for it. I, I don't know about the status of the button. I'm still not familiar enough with with the code to just add buttons is the thing. So the the button that vanished that irritates me is the add dwarf to squad from dwarfs like personality screen. Yeah, I'm 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 writing. I mean, what I'm writing right now is code that makes it easier for me personally to just add buttons to things. So <laughs> that like I decided like since I had to rework large swaths of the input code anyway, I figured might as well just like to be specific like the standard text input uh, was just completely broken. So I decided, oh, since I have to, like, rewrite every single instance of this to have some other, like, connect it, connection code around it, might as well, like, write a widget that, like, does that for you. And then I was like, but then, like, why not add more widgets so that I can do things faster later? And it's just gone, it's gotten a bit out of control. But once it's done, I should be able to, like, do quality of life stuff a lot faster because this is just how I think of UIs. Hopefully it's not too bad for the... Well, no, the thing is, the way the Tony one does it, that still works too. I haven't changed that. It's just that there's also a new way. Yeah, you just have your own method of doing things as long as it's not screwing with the original workflow. It should be fine, I would assume. Yeah, I have a bunch of comments in there explaining explaining things and explaining all the things that I am bothered by <laughs> that I wrote myself, of course. And of course, like documentation for what they all do. I, I have horrible names though. Like I have a button which just like checks if there's a mouse button and runs a callback if some if it's clicked. And then right below that, better button, which the documentation just says the button's cooler younger sibling learn to render and display text on its own. Uh, which yeah, that could be better. <laughs> so so since we're we're kind of talking about how things could be better, um, what what are some systems, especially like recent systems? I mean, like the note that I have here in my document is just uh, talking about the new job system. But like, what are some systems that like old players or new players alike don't understand that you think could be explained better in the game as to why people should interact with them that they either um i don't know use external tools to ignore entirely or um simply just get mad at um what what are some systems that you think could be explained better in dwarf fort uh so the first thing I want to say, people have been very mad at me about this. The first thing I want to say is it's not the, I don't mind people using external systems to just ignore the base systems. I don't mind that at all. I want to encourage it. It's why I've been, it's why I've helped DF hack wherever possible. And like people are starting to use therapists and figuring things out from that. And that's all good. That's, that's, that's good. That's good stuff. I am. I like that. The problem is when people try to, I don't even mind people getting mad at it. As long as they're getting mad at it for reasons, for, for its actual own issues, which exist, they're there. There's lots of them. I know about them. I played the game. I've played the game for longer than any of you with this flavor system, <laughs> uh, which is part of why, of course, I'm, I, I know a thing or two about it. But like, did, I didn't know what orderlies did <laughs> until a couple weeks after the game's release. I had to Google orderlies. I know what I knew what orderly meant and I saw that it like it had a water bucket so I figured it was people who were I figured it was rescuing giving water. I thought that was probably it. I was wrong. I had to, I asked later after people were like confused and turns out also suturing and uh wound dressing which makes sense. Neither of those actually have any uh skill like changes with skill. So it's not like a major thing that everyone does them by default. And of course, the doctoring system. Oh, Lord. I, I was about to say, I don't even need to go into detail, but I should. I really should. Uh, so how the doctoring system works. You assign someone to the doctoring occupation, the, the, the lo like the location assignment in the hospital. And then the next time uh, automatic labor assignment is run, they will be 
given the labors for diagnosis, bone setting, and surgery. Of course, each of diagnoser, bone setter, and surgeon, of course, obviously, each only signed the one thing. But uh, the thing is, the problem with all that is that automatic labor assignment is only called on the unit when a work detail changes, any work detail. And the thing is, if you're seeing your doctors do nothing, you're going to be fiddling with work details a lot. You're not just going to, like, go, oh, I'll just set minors to nobody does this and then only selected do this and that'll fix it nobody's going to think that so a lot of uh so because the ui is not is not just a bit unclear about it but also because it doesn't tell you like you can't see all of the things an individual dwarf will do at any point i think that is actually a good thing to have that would be in game just to, like see all of the here's all of the labors this dwarf is currently able to do that would be a good thing there's none of that so you can't tell that they don't actually have doctoring assigned, even though you assign them to a doctor, yet. Both of those problems, I think, come from the work detail thing, mostly, and the th other problem with it is just a lot of magic, a lot of sort of, it's not really magical thinking, but it's, like, close to it. Like, people have these rich, everyone has these, has a different ritual to get hospitals to work, and the actual, like, ritual that definitely works is go into a work detail and change anything at all. And, uh, so there's a lot of rituals, all of which work, and some of which may disagree, and people seem very confused by all that. And that is all a failure of the game itself. I am not defending Dwarf Fortress in any way with that. Let us be clear. Mm -hmm. The UI as it is... I already sent in the code to fix it so that if you assign a doctor, they're actually assigned on the spot. That That, that comes with its own problem, though. That was a one-line fix. It takes. It's going to take a bit more than that. Because uh, if Therapist or DF Hack have churned off the automatic labor assignment, which they can do uh, with a like a flag in the game thing that I asked for, it got implemented before I even started programming. That just turns off the work detail system completely, so Therapist or Labor Manager don't have to worry about getting stomped on. If you have that on, then it'll never be... <laughs> then you have to manually assign your doctors and such through Therapist mm -hmm. or whatever you have which is probably not ideal actually that's just the old uh, system then to a degree yeah and you but you also have to assign them to the hospital at the same time which is just kind of awful i don't like that i think that should i think that could be fixed and personally i think the fix for that is just like remove the labor completely and just make the hospital assignment what makes doctors do things yeah that that's the way the system looks like it works from the outside looking in yeah, and that's how it ought to work. The thing is, from the outside looking in, you also have the doctoring labors in the work detail system. Mm -hmm. And that has caused actually about as much confusion as it is warranted, honestly. It's caused <laughs> absolute pandemonium, from what I can tell. Yeah. And, like, the like the biggest... The thing that gets people the most angry about the work detail system, though, that I could see is just people, like looking at it saying, wow, there's a bunch of labors that aren't here. I have to add new labors to get people to do things. And then they add a work detail for every labor and are confused and everyone is fishing and nobody's doing anything. So I now I just have a question, which is, how is the system supposed to work? Like, in a perfect world where everything is working optimally, and how is the player supposed to interact with the job system in the game currently? Uh, jobs are done by the best available dwarf and if you don't want and if you want the and if you think the best available dwarf quote unquote is not good enough for the job you limit it only to certain dwarves that's that's the entire system yeah like if <laughs> the, the like if the available here like if you worry that of the best available dwarf will be some like dabbling armor smith and you'll end up having like crappy gauntlets this is a Perfectly reasonable worry. I worry about it. I always have an armorsmith detail. Uh, and I tell people, you should too. And uh, then you set up a work detail for it and make sure that doesn't happen. The, the, the system allows for dedicated haulers, of course. And I think that it is a bit uh, goofy that if you like assign people to hauling, specific people... Uh, the only indic there's two indicators that it has automatically selected it to only selected do this, which is uh, the check marks are now green. You don't know they're not green and unless you uh, unless you've already set something to everybody does this and then assign people to it. And it swaps everybody does this to only selected do this, which is like 
an attentional problem. Like, unless you're really good at noticing things in your peripheral vision, which mm-hmm. some people, as you know, really aren't, uh, <laughs> then you won't notice that at all. And, like, if a part of the game just requires... So th- there's a lot of things like that. It- it's a bit overwhelming right now, which is why I focused on, uh, <laughs> like, you know, objective improvements in, like, FPS and crash fixes and things like yeah. that. Once I'm more familiar, totally. I'll start, like, seeing if... There's some stuff in the weeds that I can get to with the usability of burrows or whatever. <laughs> actually, that's another great example of what's not great right now. You can't multi-Z burrows. I don't know why. I, I actually... I haven't looked into it, which is why I don't know why. Once I do know why, I'll probably try fixing it on the spot. The way I used to make burrows was literally just, like, go the first layer completely underground and then just set a, under air quotes, underground burrow, which was every single available Z-level from, like, the first underground layer down, um, which can't yeah, do the anymore. the reason I didn't notice this stuff is because... And this is goofy. I've never used burrows. Not even for civilian alerts. I just don't use them. Uh, and you can see how that's a problem. <laughs> Just let dwarves die on the surface? Well, my dwarves aren't on the surface because... See, here's the problem. I was looking at all the updates for the Steam release and I was excited at all the changes it would bring and I, like, knew everything. So I picked up the game in June and I was like, okay, I know how to use the... Okay, I've read about the new work detail system. I'll just let people do things. Wow, this works really well. I'm really happy about this. I didn't consider people had who hadn't, uh, you know, read the big post about it before. Mm-hmm. I just didn't think about that. And, uh, you know, okay, caverns, they're, they're where you do good farming now. I'll just dig straight, straight down to the caverns and try walling things up and try living that way. Uh, so nobody's ever on the surface in my force. So I didn't think about that either. <laughs> yeah, that, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I, I mean, like I, I, I kind of swap between surface forts and underground forts. I, I don't really care that like one is more or less optimal. I mean, I, I love building cavern forts and building a cavern fort right now, which is pretty much turning into that, right? Where they just kind of stand underground anyway, and you can just kind of like lock the door and there might be a cow up there for some reason, but like, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, what I do think is a bit odd is that like, I noticed the cavern invaders. They're uh, pretty intense right now. Uh, a bit, yeah. The thing is, <laughs> I I think there's a... One big thing I've noticed with the community is that they have a sort of like a very dichotomous worldview i think that the cavern invaders are a bit intense you don't have to turn them off you can just turn them down you can reduce the amount that come it's in the settings and it's 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 very manageable if you do that even for like a like if you're playing a rather peaceful fort but like they're still there so you still three or four attacking twice a year isn't gonna hurt you in the slightest yeah well right now by default it's you know 50 coming (laughs) like rather often i yeah i think i think for me it's more of a frequency issue i've got no problem with just like yo 50 amp people all wielding three shields and a spear attack once or twice a year (laughs) like that's that's just kind of hilarious one because it's a great source of materials and two they're not that strong so you just like you know get your squad of 10 or two squads of 10 dwarves and just like kill them um but i i think Uh, it can certainly catch some triple shields too I think, <laughs> I think some people certainly um like find that to be a bit overwhelming i i think there's definitely like people that come from different games that are f- used to games just being mean um <laughs> no no games mentioned but like uh, at the same time i don't know if the game being mean fits the vibe of dwarf fortress all the time i, I think right now there's some problems with like settling where the game doesn't tell you that the game is going to be mean to you like it doesn't tell you if you're settling right next to a tower i've had people tell me they're like so i'm playing my first fort outside of the tutorial and i just got invaded by 150 undead what do i do (laughs) and it's like yeah towers savage biomes evil biomes those are all very mean places yeah and the game doesn't tell you that really it really should it tells you that you're (laughs) settling on salt water and makes that sound scary yeah like savage biomes those are mean now i think that's a thing that people are like having to acclimate to they're like actually hard to yeah. deal with and it's fun i i like having the, the the variety like the variety is great i think um and there needs to be the balance there but people are still scared of aquifers <laughs> people are still scared of aquifers it's it's unfortunate i mean i i i only learned to 
work with aquifers. I was still scared of aquifers until I like played the steam release and I was like, I'm not going to edit the raws to remove aquifers and I don't have DF hack. I'm just going to learn to use aquifer. Oh, this is really easy and actually like convenient and everyone in my fort is now happy because the staircase goes through an aquifer and there's mist all the time. And why haven't I done this before? There's just some mud and at so the bottom on. and you can drain it out anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and like, and I drain it out into a well for at the bottom because like you don't need to worry about it. it's all good. It's all pretty easy. The uh, people, it, it's just like, I mean, a lot of it is people just like getting used to old stuff. But people are like just really used to old stuff, and like the another big part of the problem is that just the reputation of the game precedes itself so incredibly hard that people are still sharing stories from like 2009 or whatever, like they're relevant well, to I mean, the they're, gameplay they're of today. They're good stories, which I, I guess they are good like, stories. it's the power of Dwarf Fortress, but then at the same time you need to remind people their stories <laughs> and still relevant in those versions that people could go back and play, but... Yeah, the game is different now. Uh, the idler count was removed from the game and... In the state of the game as it is now, nothing of value was lost. In fact, I don't know if people noticed this. The idler count hasn't been functional since uh, taverns were introduced. Since 0.42, I think, since, since then. Uh, because socialization activities never counted as idle. It would just say idlers zero that, like, even as they were socializing. The reason people were using the idler count just does not exist anymore. People kept it on and were satisfied with their zero idlers, even though there were idlers probably by their reckoning. But it's a good thing there's idlers. They work better if they have the chance to. <laughs> and so on. And there, there's just all sorts of interesting stuff like that. It, you do need to balance the concerns a bit, because, like, people are... They get used to things real hard, and they, they make assumptions based on things. The wiki used to say steel was the densest met weapon metal which they assumed because it's good for blunt weapons i don't know where that came from. i mean i know where it came from it's just easy to check otherwise uh dwarf fortress the big problem with it the, the thing is you can't get mad at people being wrong because the game does not make it easy to be right it makes it really hard to be right it does not convey a lot of things and i think that's partially the beauty of it is you, you get a lot of discussion of like is this thing good i don't know and like a lot of the time I, i've been like really like telling people things explicitly what is and is not but you know what i haven't done i actually haven't done i haven't looked at how at how combat actually works i haven't looked at how the like attacks work or anything i'm still basing this off of observation and such because i think the process of discovery there is fun and people know the important stuff anyway which is that uh like stab good on armor or hammer good on armor slash bad on armor depending uh, on armor crossbow crossbow bad on armor Mm -hmm. And that's about it. That, that That's the important yeah. stuff. The rest is like little details that are just fun to find. And I think the joy of discovery is like a good chunk of the game. That's why there's like an option to, you know, hide stuff in Legends mode until you find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And cutty thing bad when there's a dude resurrecting half of it behind it. <laughs> um. So the kind of the, the last subject I have on this uh, topic talk, because uh, this has been a great conversation so far, and kind of the one that I want to close it out with was, do you have a wish list of things you'd like to add to the game if they just let you go kind of crazy with it? Uh, the thing is, like, one of the biggest things is, like, some more interaction stuff, which, like, I personally would not want to work on that yet because interaction stuff is probably going to get like table flipped for myths and magic which mm -hmm. is of course extremely exciting and uh no the well okay one interaction thing that i am thinking of that might be good there's a couple tokens in the raws called uh there's one token mundane research possible it does nothing uh i think it would be kind of fun if like I don't know how I like it would take a while and it would require a lot of like feature addition and so like it's a bit of pie in the sky thing but I think it would be cool if your scholars could sometimes just like independently figure out you know oh hey this is how you uh, become a necromancer like without having to read a slab or something I mean in the current state of necromancers that actually wouldn't be very fun at all mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's probably for the best that it doesn't work right now actually but uh there's just a lot of ways to like distribute uh interactions and magic and states of being that just aren't available and all that would be nice and fun but 
like, oh, that's myths and magic. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to... There's not much that can be done about that. The real, like, big things in terms of, like, modding that I would want to focus on are things that, like, should happen anyway, like the graphics raws. If you've seen them, they're a sight to behold. They're huge. There's just a lot of redundant info in them, and it's something. So a way to, like, make that a bit less, uh... You, like like a bit easier to write uh than that and uh just like i don't know selection criteria like being able to select and cut uh templates and things which i know why that's not possible right now it would take a it's a bit of a project to get that working but that all would be a good and okay the real pie in the sky thing actually would be uh like superseding basically all of this like the the I, I, I keep bringing up this quote as if anyone else has seen it. I kind of half suspect I got it from the Toady one in like a private like correspondence for a college project once. Uh, the ghosts of dead programmers crying out for a proper scripting language. I would not do that. I want DFHack to just work day one. <laughs> and I, would, I, it, I, I don't know what could be done to make sure that happens. And uh, I've, done, I've already done some stuff to make DFHack at least easier to work with on Steam. Because, like, right now, the way VFHack works, like, this moment, if you were to download it, if you right-click your Steam your game properties, it's like, verify game files, then the game will just stomp DFHack because it replaces one of the uh, DLL files. I've already sent in the code to make it so that, that doesn't happen anymore. It checks... It, the game explicitly checks for a, a DLL or uh, other, like, shared library thing that will, uh... It'll try to load that, and then it'll run the code from that, and DFHack will work that way instead, which is good. That's that's one step, but I think that, like, the, the important thing here is that, like, the big pie in the sky thing is proper scripting support, and DFHack is that already. You don't need to reinvent the wheel on that, necessarily. So I guess the next step above that is, like, just including, like, instead of DFHack having to, like, have, like their own written utilities that try to do all of the stuff that the game itself does. Just, like, expose certain functions or whatever that, like... You know, like, right now it's really hard to, uh... create a unit via DFHack. There's a lot that goes into that. And, uh, it would be nice. I, I don't know if this is even... if this is even going to be feasible like, far into the future. It would be nice if they just, like, exposed a little function like, off in the distance that says, create unit with the following things, and then it can just do that. That sort of thing, I guess, is the real thing. I, I just like modding. Uh, that's The thing is, I think modding is, at its best, when it's doing something the creator, the original creator of the game, would not do, but that the game is, like, technically capable of allowing. As such, I think that any, like, features or anything I could add... There's no way I could even, for personalization purposes and for all that other stuff, anything that I personally would want is just completely, like, superseded by the fact that, like, I could add what I personally want and a bunch of other people could add what they personally want if I allow such and such to be modded. And, uh, that's actually kind of part of... I don't want to say this, almost. Part of the hope with, like, the modular UI stuff that I'm writing for entirely for myself is that it might be uh, easier for DF Hack and such to add their own stuff to the UI that way. Like, they, they already do, and it actually works really well. To make it even easier, that'd be really good. Like, obviously, ideally, you'd be able to do that without DF Hack and just, like, have raw modding the UI in various interesting ways, but that's, <laughs> that's even more work, actually.